Hello everyone, welcome back to AP Government and Politics. Um, and I just want to let you know, we just got done with federalism and now we're going to go over the federalism Supreme Court cases. So by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to explain how the appropriate balance of power between national and state governments has been interpreted differently over time. To explain how the distribution of powers among three federal branches between national and state governments impact policy. So the Tenth Amendment states that was ratified in 1791 states that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In other words, any powers that have not been given to the federal government, um, they'll be given to the states. And another amendment that you will see frequently that was cited um, between the two Supreme Court cases was the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868. But our primary focus would be Section 1. And it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States, of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, in our federalism lecture, um, Basically, federalism reflects the dynamic distribution of power between national and state governments. So remember that <clears throat> that chart that I showed you with the federal, uh, the enumerated powers, which which is the federal powers, the state powers, uh, and the concurrent powers, or the, the concurrent powers that both federal and the state government. Um, share and then the state powers are what we consider the reserved powers. So that's the, we will understand um, the power of both the national and state governments with these two Supreme Court cases. So let's get into both of those cases. So the first case is McCulloch versus Maryland. Uh, it was argued and decided in 1819. And as you read in the um, the brief, um, we're just going to quickly go over the facts of the case. So let's get into that. So the facts were that in 1816, Congress char chartered the Second Bank of the United States. Then in 1818, the state of Maryland passed legislation to impose taxes on the bank. Um, but then James W. McCulloch, the cashier of the Baltimore branch of the bank, refused to pay the tax. Um, and then the state court, the state appeals court, held that the second bank was unconstitutional because the Constitution did not provide a textual commitment for the federal government to charter a bank. <clears throat> so. Now we get into the legal issues, the issues that were uh, in question before the Supreme Court. So first question is, or issue is, did Congress have the authority to establish the bank? And second, did the Maryland law unconstitutionally interfere with congressional powers? And now we're going to go back to the debate, uh, Jefferson versus Hamilton. Um, now, the debate and the rivalry between Jefferson and Hamilton, um, you will learn, even in your American history class, that these two men, their debate and their clash for forged a nation um, as we know of it today. So Hamilton, um, he was the person that actually um, came up with the first national bank and he was actually the first treasury secretary of the United States. So, you know, obviously Hamilton, this case was kind of near and dear to his heart, knowing that that there is a possibility that Congress could actually call the national bank unconstitutional. 
So um, let's get into the details of the second national bank, the bank that is really in question in this Supreme Court case. So the second bank um, was the charter of the first bank that expired in 1811. So as you can tell, this was like right before the War of 1812 um, and the United States pretty much almost almost out of uh, bankruptcy um, after um, the American Revolution and the um, the other, the Indian, the uh, French and Indian War. Now, after debate and reconsideration, the second bank was chartered in 1816. Um, now, the post-war boom helps, but the Depression in 1818, it was a fiscal depression downturn of the economy this occurred mainly because of the war of 1812 um and then the bank short of cash reserves calls in its excessive loans so and um because the bank was short on like cash <clears throat> it they had to call in um ex excessive loans to fund the, the nation after um the economic turmoil and then of course the agricultural um, depression that was going on as well. Now, this leads to the Baltimore branch. Now, the Baltimore branch was notorious and ran, it was ran by crooks and pirates. I mean, obviously things haven't changed. A lot of things are being ran by crooks and crooks and cronies now. Um, and James McCulloch was the bank's cashier and main lobbyist in Washington. So he had really close ties to you know the presidents and the executives um, in Washington, and McCulloch was the bank's chief financial officer of the bank. Um, McCulloch and his cronies loot the bank, so they had unsecured loans. They are sanctioning unreported overdrafts in Maryland. They attempt to tax the bank out of existence. Other states were also taking action against bank branches, um, and basically how they viewed the bank and how McCulloch really ran the Baltimore bank is if you don't pay, nobody got punished and the state can ta tax anything within borders. Um, and they did not count the money. So can you imagine a bank not counting money? That'd be pretty, pretty bad. Now, onto the summary of the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, the summary is that Hamilton urges the creation of a national bank and Congress complied with the first bank, as I stated earlier. Um, and Washington seeks advice, George Washington, seeks advice on the constitutionality from this cabinet. So, you know, obviously Hamilton wanted this bank and Washington had to make sure his treasury secretary um, that this was okay to actually make it um, constitutional. And obviously Hamilton argued that this bank is constitutional. Obviously, you know, I'm pretty sure he cited that, you know, Congress has the right to uh, levy taxes. So in order to levy taxes, you need some type of a bank to manage the money. Um, and to fund things. Um, Jefferson, um, on the other hand, he argued that the bank is unconstitutional. And um, ultimately, obviously, Washington follows the advice of Hamilton and the first bank. And now the second national bank is now, um, is now in its existence. So individually, Jefferson's position was in his legal argument was the necessary and proper clause does not justify the creation of a bank, not in an expansion of government and an increase of power. So he, Jefferson believed that this bank um, would ultimately expand the power of the government um, and make the national government much more stronger and probably a little less, uh, less able to handle. Um, and Jefferson emphasizes the word necessary, absolutely necessary. He wanted to make sure was this, was this, um, bank absolutely necessary? Did it fit the necessary, um, the necessary 
the need, was it necessary, absolutely necessary to have a national bank? <clears throat> now, necessary um, must limit the clause or else it will swallow up all delegated powers. So basically, he wanted to make sure that this necessary and proper clause had some limits to it, that we that people would not abuse this clause um, as a as a gimme or a loophole to have other things um, that they wanted. Um, and the clause will become a vehicle to, to invade powers reserved to the states. And like I said, that is the 10th Amendment, and I'll just kind of read it verbally back to you. It said, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, on to Hamilton's position. So, he, he believed that necessary does not mean required. So, absolutely necessary does not mean the only way. Necessary often means no more than needful, requisite, incited, useful, or conducive to. So there was like this, not only was it a political debate, but it was like a word play, like a word definition uh, battle. What does necessary really mean? Um, in between Jefferson and Hamilton, and he goes on to say that this is not a limitation at the tail end, um, it's not like a means to an end, um, and he believed that this expands congressional power. So when you have this national bank, that means that Congress can control all the whole country's money. And he believed that this is just unnecessary. He believes that this will, you know, expanding congressional power. Um, and he also stated that necessary and proper cost sanctions the notion of implied power. So, you know, obviously he believed that the necessary and proper clause was implied that um, that it's, it's, it's given. Um, it's a given, you know, that we, that, you know, Congress needs to have a national bank. Um, so, next we have the Hamilton's test of constitutionality. So, this is how we test Hamilton's, uh, Ham test to see if Hamilton's uh, need for the first and second national bank is really constitutional. So here are the questions that we have to ask. It says, is the end within the powers of the, con of the Congress? Two, does the means selected have a obvious relation to the end? And three, does the proposed measure abridge pre-existing rights of states or individuals? So if we were able to answer Yes, if you're able to answer yes to to all these questions, then um, that then that means that the second national bank is constitutional. Now you cannot say that the creation of the bank was a bold and plain assertion of power by the national government. The idea of deference to the political branches. So. You can't say, oh, us creating this bank, it's, it's, it's bold, and um, it's a bold power of, of, of the government. Um, it's basically the idea of these political branches of getting their say as well. They, the other branches, the, they have to be able to buy in. You know, obviously, Washington bought into it because he believed that the National Bank was, in fact, constitutional. But now we're getting into the next, the third branch, um, which is the Supreme Court, and they have to say, okay, um, is this national bank really necessary? Is it an implied power of the Congress? So um, let's kind of move on from there. Um, now, obviously, Maryland, you know, in this Supreme Court case, obviously, Maryland had their own arguments. And this is what Maryland argued. It says that the powers of the federal government must be exercised in subordination to the states who passes supreme domin dominion, stated in the Articles of Confederation. And this, which pretty much says that states are free, independent, and sovereign. So Maryland was going back to the um, Articles of Confederation that they wanted to go back to this idea of that the federal government should be limited in its power and that having a central government would cause would 
would mean that the federal government is too powerful and the state government there's no um there's no room for the states to be free independent or sovereign in itself um now on the other hand marshall's argue answer um was that the constitution proceeds um, directly from the people of the United States. So he's like, all right, guys, but remember, uh, you gave us power to rule this thing called popular sovereignty, um, this notion of, um, of this, this notion that uh, we have nat natural rights and the notion of social contract that, you know, you gave us power to rule um so you know you gotta you got you're almost mandated by us as you the people of the federal government so obviously as we learned earlier about the constitutional convention that it presented the proposal to the people and the, the people decided to accept it they're they're like yep we're all in um you know with the ratification of the constitution and the people uh, acted through their states, but ratification always was an act of the people. Um, so, and the decision of the people was final in the bound and bounds this bound the state government. So you know it's like, well, guys, you know you people, the people, um, you bought into this, you wanted this, uh, you say yes to the Constitution. So here we are today. <clears throat> you can't go back and and um, cry wolf. Um, the union, um, is a government that, uh, other people, not the state. So, it, um, so basically Marshall's, Marshall's answer to, to Maryland's argument was, look, we, it is a union, other government, uh, it's a government of the people, not the states that it is the people that makes, that makes the decision. Um, and just so you're aware, Marshall, John Marshall, uh, was the, as I said earlier in the federalism, um, lecture was the chief Supreme Court justice during this time. Um, and he was a federalist. So he believed in a stronger federal government. Um, and he, his sole purpose was to expand the powers of the federal government. Now, the powers of Congress. So, the national government is a government of enumerated powers. It may only exercise those powers given it. So, they can't go beyond the scope of the second, um, I'm sorry, it cannot go beyond the scope of this um, Article 2 of the, Con Article 1 of the Constitution, my apologies. Um, so, anything beyond Article 1, it would, I would say, I it's kind of, kind of difficult for me to say but it but it is this would be it would be an abuse of power um and then the national government has limited powers it is supreme within its spheres of action we have a limited national government and congress is supreme um and what what causes what causes this limited type of government is the constitution the constitution limits the national government to do certain things so when the power when um the executive branch goes beyond the scope of the article two of the constitution that'd be an abuse of power you're going outside of the powers um that have been given to them all right now what are the the enumerated powers we learned this i told you about this in our last lecture that the enumerated powers are the powers of Congress, so Article 1 of the Constitution, and it is, like I said, uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Um, there's no specific enumerated power that allows for the creation of a bank, so this is kind of Jefferson's argument, say, hey guys, uh, you know, you put in a lot of powers here, but I don't see one for the creation of a bank. Um, and Jefferson was like, no, 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 that's, this ain't, this isn't constitution, constitutional, and the language of the constitution is not as limiting as the Articles of Confederation, so that's why people were going back to the Articles of Confederation, because it was such a weak document, and the, the powers were so vague, and so broad, that, if the Articles of Confederation were our primary document, 
I really don't know what would happen. I mean, this is, you know, I, it's, it will be hard. It, it's, it's kind of weird to believe that what would happen, it, what would our country be like if the Articles of Confer- Confederation was our constitution, that there was no constitutional convention? What would our country look like? It will be all parties will be all it'd be unlimited power they can everyone can do whatever they want so you know but jefferson was arguing that there is no language in the constitution um that the language of the constitution is not limiting at the at the articles of federation so um the reach of the enumerated powers required a fair constitution of the entire constitution so the that little article one section eight of that little piece in article one it must be it must be a fair constitution a constitution within itself that's crazy to believe but that's kind of the argument with enumerated powers and that a constitution is not a legal code it's not like criminal code or civil code or um anything like that a consti- the constitution is a uh, v- i wouldn't say they but it is a blanketed um the blanketed laws of our country now we must never forget that it is a constitution we are expounding like we are expounding the constitution we are expanding the powers of the constitution here now article one section one um outlines the necessary and proper cause um which we went over earlier in the federalism um uh lecture and I'm just going to read the necessary and proper clause where it says to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, see it there, for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this constitution in the government of the United States in any department or officer thereof. So this clause specifically sanctions the idea of implied power. So all that whole spiel about, oh, powers that are really implied, you know, having the requirement of a national bank, it's implied that we need one, right? And necessary and power clause are like, mm, not really. And Marilyn echoes Jefferson and argues that the clause is limited by the word necessary so you know it must be necessary um to have this national bank and marshall was like comes back and says and answers with hamilton and madison that necessary um admits to all degrees of comparison and the clause omits the word absolutely um here when it appears in other clauses so they're saying all right so absolute so what is more specific absolutely or necessary so like i said we have this thing of it's like a case of word play here where we're playing off the definition of words um and what is really and truly necessary and proper um answering the question of the constitutionality of a Um, national bank and when it was all said and done the ruling of the of the um the ruling of the supreme court the court had decided that congress had the power to create a national bank of the united states according to the necessary and proper clause of the constitution and the decision gave more power to the federal government. So after this whole back and forth, the, the definition of necessary, it really should be absolutely, um, you know, the vagueness of the of the necessary and proper clause. We should have an Articles and Federation say, you know, you gave us the power, you people gave us the power. It was all said and done. The Supreme Court ruled that the National Bank was, in fact, um, constitutional under the necessary and proper clause. All right. So, on our second federalism Supreme Court case, we have United States v. Lopez in 1995. So, fairly recent um, Supreme Court case. So, this here, this little picture here that you see, this is actually a... um, this is actually a 
newspaper post article on the decision. So it says, High Court kills law banning guns in a school zone. Bitterly divided ruling. It was a 5 4 decision. It decision deals blow to federal government role in. For, I think, a, uh, probably a role in. Um, this is this is just the excerpt here. All right, so the next, so onto the facts of the case, uh, you should have read the uh, the actual um, the actual case, um, and we're just going to briefly go over the facts of the case. So in 1992, Alfonso Lopez, a high school senior, walked into his San Antonio high school with a concealed weapon. He was arrested for violating a law that prohibited firearm possession on school grounds. At first, Lopez was charged in a court in Texas, but he was later charged with violating the Gun Free Schools Act, a federal offense. Um, Lopez was found guilty and appealed to the Supreme Court, arguing that this law was an overreach of an this law was an overreach of congressional power because schools were supposed to be controlled at the state level, not the federal level, and the court agreed with him and overturned the conviction. Um, and you can actually get the actual full text of the Gun Free, Gun Free Schools Act. Um, you can scan the QR code and you'll be able to hear on the uh, right bottom right corner and you actually can see the full text of the Gun Free Schools Act. So, um, here the court stated that there were, the, the, here are the legal issues, that there were three broad activities that Congress, Congress could rule, could use in interstate commerce. So, this was a state of interstate commerce. So, one, the channels of interstate commerce. Two, the instrumentalities of interstate commerce. And number three, any activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. So, you know, obviously this is a take on, a, yes, this course this case is raises the question of federalism but it also raises the issue of interstate commerce so keep keep that in mind as well um in this case the act has nothing to do with commerce or an economic enterprise and it is not an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity. Furthermore, the act has no express jurisdictional element that will limit its reach to a distinct set of firearms possession that would affect interstate commerce. The act has no legislative findings or history to show that it is a proper use of the commerce power. The government argued that gun, that school gun violent violence leads to nationwide crime or that an unsafe school leads to less national productivity are unavailing. So basically summarizing this this whole statement here is that this case has n had nothing to do with ec um, economics, had nothing to do with interstate commerce. The real question lies in federalism. Does, did the state um, of Texas was this a question of a, was it a state issue or a national issue? Um, and, you know, obviously the ruling was that, no, this case has nothing to do with commerce, has nothing to do with economic enterprise. This is all to do between federal and state powers It in, in rights here. So the ruling... Um, was ruled and the Supreme Court ruled that the power of Congress to regulate activities under the Commerce Clause extends only to those activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. Carrying a handgun to school does not substantially affect interstate commerce. So people were making this argument, hey, this is an interstate commerce issue. And the Supreme Court was like, uh, no, this is more of a question of federalism um and that was a ruling that this has nothing to do with economics this is everything to do with um the difference between enumerated powers and reserved powers and obviously the ruling uh showed that it was all about reserved powers 
Um, so with that being said, um, when you have, let me actually go back to that slide. So when you have, when you, when it's a battle between uh, enumerated powers of the federal government and the, um, the reserve powers of the state government and the ruling was that, oh no, this, this is everything to do with the reserve powers, the Supreme, the case goes back to the state um, and that ruling, the ruling should be and is sustained um, in the state court. Now, uh, what is the significance of U.S. v. Lopez? Well, Lopez preserved the system of federalism, obviously, which delegates certain powers to states and certain powers to the federal government. It upheld the principle that states have control of local issues, like gun possession on school grounds. Lopez was the first case in a long time that stated that the federal government had overstepped its bounds that, and that Congress had given itself too much power under the Commerce Clause. This case reaffirmed the balance of power between federal and state governments. So, I mean, can you believe the all shock, the all the shock that had that permeated after this ruling, where the Supreme Court was like, uh, tap tapping on the shoulder, like, um, you kind of overstepped your bounds, and and this, um, this this the you know you have overstepped your bounds. You are Congress. You are giving yourself way too much power, and you know this this is we must go back to the balance of powers here. Um, so you can imagine the Supreme Court being part of the federal government, being part of the three branches of the federal government there, and the Supreme Court's like, mm, um, no, 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 no. That would, absolutely not um, in this case. So as we compare the two cases, McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819 and the decision in U.S. v. Lopez in 1995, uh, McCulloch v. Maryland was that the federal government has implied powers not explicitly granted in the Constitution to carry out its, enumer its enumerated powers. So they used the implied powers uh, argument to expand the powers of the, um, of the government. And the decision in U.S. v. Lopez is that the federal government government may not use the Commerce Clause to ban guns in school zones because schools were under state jurisdiction. So it, it was U.S. v. Lopez goes back to the states. McCulloch v. Maryland expands the power of the federal government. Um, so this concludes our federalism uh, unit or lecture um, on the federalism Supreme Court cases. Um, next, we will start on the Constitution, and we'll start off with the seven basic principles of the Constitution. Um, please make sure that you watch the National Constitution Center tutorial, as you will be using that to read the Constitution. Um, and I will make sure to, um, you know, make sure that you are well prepared for our Constitution unit, which is gonna we're gonna be in there for a while um, because it does take a long time. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week, and if, like I said, if you have any questions, as always, you can certainly message me um, through SETI Island, or you can email me, and I'll be happy to assist you, and I hope